It was 2017. I had come to Japan being self-employed the year prior. I had become a dad since and the contract I had with my German client was running out. It was time to look for a job. For me, being a non-native English speaker, teaching English, commonly known as the easiest way to find work in Japan as a foreigner, was out of the question. And coming from a software engineering background, the direction was clear for me. I went on the hunt for an IT job in Japan. I then worked for a Japanese company in Tokyo for close to four and a half years, both as a software engineer and engineering manager. In that capacity, I interviewed more than a hundred people. Today, I will share with you what I learned. I will share with you how to get an IT job in Japan. The easiest way to come to and work in Japan is probably still being an English teacher. Many people don't want to do that though. Standing in front of a class, trying to teach English all day for a salary that, depending on your expectations, can be less than satisfying. Japan has seen a shortage of IT personnel and by 2030, around 600,000 professionals are projected to be missing in the country. Here's how you can get one of these positions and make it a 599,999. Let's get into it. What do you need to get an IT job in Japan? Well, ideally you have an existing career in the field you want to get into, a university degree, live in Japan, speak Japanese on a really high level and have an N1 certificate to prove that. This skill set will give you access to the biggest amount of positions you can apply for. Now, obviously, most of us don't have that. And while not having all of these limits your selection to some extent, there are still lots of attractive positions out there waiting for you. Even if you don't have a strong IT background yet, the 2023 Tokyo Dev Developer Survey has shown that 13.7% of the 674 respondents had taken a coding bootcamp to enhance their skills. One such camp is the immersive course by Code Chrysalis, who is also the sponsor of this video. This bootcamp happens over the course of three months in person in Tokyo, Japan. It is ideal for you if you already have basic knowledge of a programming language, such as JavaScript, since the course will go way beyond that. Some of the topics covered are data structures and complexities, which will at the very least be handy for many interviews, Agile methodologies and practices, aka how do people work together, databases, API architectures, front-end frameworks, CI-CD, continuous integration, continuous delivery, and also a final senior project in which you will build a product and work on your own mini startup. There's also a one-month self-paced pre-course where you get into functional and object-oriented programming, version control with Git, Node.js, and others. All in all, a very useful set of skills, really close to what you will likely be using in your job. Once you are done with the bootcamp, and this is super valuable, they also include a lifetime career support. The interview deadline is February 9th, and if you use the code JAPANESEJOURNEY15, you get 15% off on the tuition. You can find the bootcamp at bit.ly slash Japanese journey code chrysalis and also linked in the description. And this actually reminds me of a funny story. About six months into my job in Japan, my recruiter called me and said she wanted to meet up. We met at a restaurant in Roppongi, close to where I was working, and she introduced me to her successor. As it turned out, she wanted to understand more about the stuff the people she was headhunting were doing, did a coding camp, got excited, received three job offers, changed career and became an Android developer. That's how things go, if you take bootcamps. When it comes to Japanese, it's ideal if you are able to speak it. However, I wasn't on a high enough level back when I started my employment there either. There are a couple of things that would be good to know though, and we'll go over that in a later part of the video. Job hunting aside, once you are in Japan, having a sufficiently high level of Japanese will make your life significantly more satisfying. So I highly recommend you to study it. Already living in Japan also helps, no question, but it's not a total necessity. It can also help to come on a tourist visa and do some interviews there. I know at least two people who did that. One joined my company and the other one a popular messaging app. 
Also, applying from abroad is totally a possibility and quite some people in my company and actually also from my team did it. Now, let's have a quick look at where to find the right job description for you. I personally, back in 2017, went through a site called Gaijinport Jobs. The positions there were not super attractive, but applying to some of them brought me in contact with recruiters who then took care of getting the right job descriptions for me instead of me searching myself. And this is the route that I would also definitely recommend. I was using Spring Executive back then, but there are also others such as G-Talent or Code2Work. And these days there are also sites dedicated to IT professionals such as Japan Dev or Tokyo Dev, which are linked in the description box below. These are especially convenient since you can filter, for example, for companies allowing applicants from abroad, directly see the salary ranges and more. Other useful job pages include the usual suspects such as LinkedIn or Indeed. Once you have found a job you liked, you can start getting into the application process. This usually means providing your details and also your CV. When looking at CVs, I always felt the shorter the better. One page is perfect. There are not a lot of one-page CVs, but the ones I looked at were always very concise and on point. Making it short helps you strip it down to the essentials. Two pages should be the maximum. Everything longer than that just adds a lot of noise and most recruiters will have lost their interest by then. When writing the CV, keep in mind whom you are writing it for and what they want to see. You have a Japan-based audience, so overly embellishing your skills might not be the best idea. And also, obviously, don't lie. Your name at the top, then maybe a quick outline about yourself and what you value. For example, experienced iOS developer with a strong focus on clean architecture and usability. Things that communication and understanding of the users are core skills for a successful software engineer. With that, very quickly, you have given them an understanding that you are focused on the best practices when it comes to code, but also are a team player and have an understanding for the user. All your personal information, such as how to contact you, is something you can put to the side on your CV. This way, it's still easily accessible, but doesn't get in the way of the really important stuff. Then directly get into your relevant work experience. Mention what you worked on and in what capacity, your tech stack and from when until when. Sort from newest at the top to oldest. If you left a position rather soon, for example, after a year or so or even earlier, and you have a good reason for that, such as the company being in financial trouble, I would recommend you mention that as well. Same goes for your education. Keep it very brief. Mention your university and degree, if you have one, and any certifications that are relevant for the job, such as the bootcamp you graduated from. No need to go into extensive detail there. Just keep it short. You can also list your skills. Many people seem to like giving them ratings on a scale from 1 to 5. I personally wouldn't do that because it's very subjective and also makes for an easy target in an interview. If you absolutely want to put a number, mentioning your years of experience should do the job. Your language skills should also be on the CV somewhere, graded with conversational, business, or native. Back when I started looking for a job, having a picture of yourself on the CV was pretty common in Japan as well. These days, I think for IT, it's not a necessity anymore. If you want to have one but don't want to suit up, you can do it like I did recently and AI generate your picture. Once you have handed in your application, you wait. At some point, someone should be in touch either from the company, if you applied to it directly, or from the recruiting agency you applied through. And if everything went well, you will be invited to the next step in the hiring process. This step can either be an interview or a challenge. Some companies have challenges right in the start of the process, others somewhere in between, and others don't have them at all. 
back when looking for a job, one challenge I received was to review an app somebody else had written and another one was to write a relatively simple but from scratch application. You can't be sure what the people judging you will be exactly looking for, but the job description might give you some clue. Are they looking for a product implemented really fast, or really clean, really stable? If it's front-end, beautifully designed or animated? Beyond that, you can consider how you can go the extra mile and over-deliver to them. When it comes to interviews, most bigger companies have at least three stages of them. One or two will be technical and another one or two will be about the team, company and culture fit. Some companies will let you know what to wear. If in doubt, go with business casual. That means a white shirt and a suit, but no tie. I have been interviewed by people in shorts for an interview where it said casual. I still made sure to wear a polo shirt though, just to make sure my professional intent came across. In the beginning, there will most likely be a self-introduction and in some instances, they will ask you to do it in Japanese, even if the rest of the interview is in English. Self-intros are important in Japan. So this is one part where being well prepared can come a long way. You should state your name and where you're from, as well as your relevant work experience. Don't go over every detail of your CV, but keep it short and to the point Two minutes should be enough. If it's in Japanese, use Japanese you're comfortable with, but not casual. This must form is a must, and if your keigo goes beyond that, go ahead and use it. Other common interview contents are of course technical details about your field, as well as basics. For a software engineering job, it could be data structures, runtime and space complexities. Since you are a foreigner, the question about your reason for being in or wanting to move to Japan will likely come up as well. Your answer should make sense and convince the interviewers that you have a good reason for living in Japan. It can be anything that's safe for work, but it should be convincing and also presented in a convincing manner. I love the culture and can't imagine anything better than living in Japan. I'm a food lover and living in Japan is a dream coming true. All perfectly good reasons. They might also ask you how good your Japanese is and they might do so in Japanese. This is to see how well you could communicate with Japanese speaking colleagues, but also because it is more likely you'll stay in Japan for an extended period of time if you can speak Japanese reasonably well. If you have frequent job changes on your CV, say, earlier than after two years, they might also ask about that. I didn't like it there anymore would not be a good answer because it shows volatility. The company got into financial trouble and I was let go is good. They might also ask you why you are looking for a change. Here again, you should have a good answer, something other than I didn't like it there anymore and because I want more money. When asked why you applied to them, this is the point where you can shine with your knowledge about the company and share how its mission aligns with you personally. Another question that might come up either in an interview or otherwise early in the process is your expected salary. What Japanese companies often do is ask for your current salary at 10% or so on top and that is the offer. You can try not to give them anything to see what they actually expect to pay for your role, but it might annoy them and make them think you're not easy to work with. When personally directly asked about my expected salary in interviews, I avoided giving a concrete answer. I did that not by straight up saying, I don't want to say that, but rather by having some kind of excuse like, I would need to talk to my wife about that. An interview is not only about the company's questions to you, but also about your questions to them. Do your research and prepare them beforehand. Nothing shows I don't care more than a candidate that doesn't want to know more about the position they are applying to. Good generic questions could be what person would be successful in this position? And do you have any doubts about me joining your company? Throughout the interview, I would urge you to talk concisely and straight to the point. Don't use overly complicated language. 
If you don't know something, it's often better to tell them than talk around it and through that let them know that you don't know but don't want to say. If everything has gone well and you nailed the challenge and all the interviews, you will receive a call from some HR person or your recruiter with the positive message that the company would like to hire you. Most companies will set up an offer meeting to talk through the contract conditions and solve any unclarities. It is at this point that you can negotiate your salary if you wish to, but also at a later point before sharing your final decision should be okay. It is fine to do so, although I haven't seen it done a lot in my previous company and even more rarely has it been done successfully. Then you sign the contract and, if you are not in Japan, start the visa procedure and prepare your move. Congratulations! But wait, should you actually move? What about all those people that work themselves to death in Japan? Aren't there unbelievable amounts of overtime every month? It depends. Legally, weekly work time is 40 hours and overtime needs to be compensated. In order to not do that, some companies make you sign a form saying you give them a certain amount of overtime for free, the so-called service overtime. A common number here is 20 hours per month. Anything beyond that would need to be compensated by the company as well. Overtime that needs to be compensated is done so at least with a factor of 1.25. That means if you earn 2000 yen per hour usually, you will get 2500 yen for your overtime. There are legal limits as to how much overtime you can do. You are not allowed to do more than 100 hours per month and no more than 720 hours per year. The longest I personally did was around 50 hours a month, but the average in my first year was about 20 to 25, I think, and way less in the following years. How aggressive companies demand overtime really depends on the company, the department and the team. If there's a big amount of foreign employees, I would say chances are that overtime is not happening too much. There are so-called black companies which don't spend too much attention on legal circumstances and just do as they please. In these companies, something called power harassment might also be happening. Power harassment includes verbal or physical behavior that goes beyond business necessity and takes advantage of superior positions in a workplace relationship. In short, your boss is abusing his or her power. Some companies are afraid of the backlash power harassment could bring and therefore treat it very seriously and give regular training to their leaders. That was also the case in the company I worked for. When it comes to holidays, the legal requirement is that you get 10 days after 6 months in the company, 11 days after 18 months, 12 days after 30 and then it increases by 2 days every year until you reach 20 days. These holidays also cover sick leaves. That means if you get corona and are out for two weeks, there goes your yearly holidays. Some companies offer sick leaves in addition to regular holidays, so this might be a nice bonus to watch out for when job hunting. By law, you are required to take at least five days of holidays each year, and if you don't, your company will be fined. Japan also has 16 national holidays. If a holiday happens to be on a Sunday, the day after this holiday is observed, meaning you will get that day off. When it comes to salary, it totally depends on your position, the demand for what you are doing, your experience level and the company you are applying to. Entry salaries can be in the range of 4 million yen, whereas the 2023 Tokyo Dev Developer Survey has shown that the respondent's average salary was 8.5 million yen which would put you well above the Japanese average income. Now that you know all this, will it be easy? Maybe. It depends on your attitude, mostly, and what you can already bring to the table. Some companies hire around 10% of applicants, others only one. So there's no shame in failing some interviews. In fact, statistically, it's highly likely. Then you'll learn something from that and move on until you make it. Oh, and for your own sake, 
please learn Japanese.